Are you guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. Bring it on. Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. I'm Reeve Hamilton. On this episode, we're talking about ethics, specifically the ethics surrounding the use of data and artificial intelligence. I'm joined by Mary Simone, an accomplished musician and composer and dean of the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Rensselaer. Hi, Reeve. Thank you for your invitation today. And Jim Hendler, Tetherless World Chair of Computer, Web, and Cognitive Sciences and Director of the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Applications. Pleased to be here. Now, just to get started, I wanted to take the temperature as we see artificial intelligence expanding and growing, conversations about ethics or considerations about ethics. Where are we currently at? Are they happening or should we be more concerned about it? What's your sense? Jim, we'll start with you. So the answer is yes to both. (laughs) The good news is I think it's starting to happen. The bad news is I do think we need to be a lot more uh, aware of it. I think we need to be educating people more on it. I think we need to be developing a much more significant understanding of this. So um, I often use the analogy that coming out of World War II, there was a big growth in the field of biology. And simultaneous with that grew the field of bioethics, partly because of the abuses that had happened during the war. And so the, the history is a little bit rocky, but eventually you had the bioethicists and the biologists becoming very, very intertwined, really working together. And so now when somebody does, uh, you know, a cloning experiment that violates the norms, the whole field comes down and says, wait, that wasn't appropriate. In AI, we don't have that yet. We're still we're still working with it. So there has been a fair amount of discussion. In fact, the president of um, the U.S. released a set of uh, White House objectives and things like that. And one of the key areas is what they call trusted AI, uh, a theme we have here too in some of our research, which is sort of fairness, bias, correct use of data. And and it goes beyond that. And I think Mary and I have had some conversations about that, so I'll turn it over to her. Absolutely. So one thing that's interesting is as, as you look back in history, say what happened after World War II and how bioethicists have started to work collaboratively with bio biologists and then in biomedical engineering, um, we actually have an opportunity here to take a leadership role in integrating um, the development of ethics around the development of AI. And there have been many things that have happened in the past. If you look towards science fiction and some of those things where, you know, computers are colluding you know, to take over humanity. And there's also some other really wonderful TV shows where (laughs) robots, you know, rise up and and imprison humans. Um, Those things are actually possible. And until we can wrestle with those questions that seem terrifying, um, but really strike at the very core of what it means to be human and our humanity, we will... um, run the risk of, as Stephen Hawking said, create one of the biggest disasters in human history, which would be generalized artificial intelligence. Well, when you say those things are possible, how possible are they today, or how how far in the future are you looking? So I think the, you know, so one of the things we actually need research in, and I'm right now working with some people in the policy level to try to define some of this, is some research into some of that. Um, I don't think, I personally don't think, and most of the people I know who are serious AI scientists who've been in the field for a long time don't really think we're going to see that kind of thing in the near future. But we think using that as a thought experiment for helping to guide the ethics is crucial. Just, Just as 20 years ago, the bioethicists started thinking about things like cloning. It wasn't yet, re- you know, human cloning wasn't anywhere near ready to happen. But by the time people started getting to where we might do it, there's already been some thinking. But there's also a lot of very short-term ethics questions, things like face recognition. How good is it? Where can it deploy? Where should it be deployed? Personal privacy issues, how much should and shouldn't be shared between companies and things like that. So a lot of the, so, so I think there's both a very clear short-term kind of um, we often use the term algorithmic accountability. How do we know what these things are doing questions? 
um, and then questions about sort of fairness and bias and their use, which I'm sure will come up in the conversation. And then there's these longer term issues, which I think get into more of the kind of questions Mary was asking about uh, general intelligence, things like that. But I think the short term, you know, when it's putting someone out of work, that that's a big deal, regardless of whether that's a general intelligence that's doing it or something that only knows how to drive a truck. If it still puts a truck driver out of work. Right. So, so things like that, I think, are very important and, you know, related to the future of work. But we're seeing things right now where, you know, in the Department of Defense, they're developing soldier robots. Um, and whether or not they actually have the ethical framework to make good decisions on the battlefield are, I mean, those are issues that are happening today. So in facial recognition, I mean, we have standards of privacy here in this country, and of course, they're now different in Europe in the way that they um, regulate that. And then, of course, you can go to China and see what's happening Very there. Different. I mean, there's, even though as humanity globally, we've kind of all grown up together, our own standards of what um, constitutes moral behavior is vastly different as we, you know, tra traverse different cultures. And I mean, I think that's one thing where global entities really need to take some responsibility for these discussions. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. But I also think that cultural sensitivity is another very important thing we have to teach our students to understand. So, um, you know, when you look at something like face recognition or, or social credit score. So in mm -hmm. China now, almost everything you do is being monitored by a machine and you get a notion of social credit. And in the U.S., that feels like a very... Um, no one really likes the idea. In China, that's actually... They have a notion of social credit that's always been there. Now this is just kind of using computers to help do it. So much as we get a financial credit score... Right there, they would see a financial credit score as odd, right? right. Because their their world doesn't revolve in the same way ours does around finance. So, right. so again, you have these very different ideas from country to country. And if we're going to write inter, you know, write technologies that can be deployed, we need both an understanding of what they do, but also when you're deploying them in a culture, to understand what would the differences be and how do we make it clear to people what they do and don't do. I yeah. think the idea of social credit was uh, featured prominently in a somewhat horrifying scientific uh, science fiction scenario in an episode of Black Mirror. Yep. So mm -hmm. for us, it's it's very much a scary story. That's right. But when you get to the idea of responsibility, I mean, whose responsibility is it to decide what the ethical standards are across cultures, within cultures? Is it individuals? Is it the government? That is a crazy hard question. <laughs> And, We've got a few minutes. Um, you know, it's 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 an interesting question. Okay, so if you take the notion that the people who should regulate and create guidelines around a around a particular practice that may involve AI, I mean, the people that are most rooted in that discipline, in my view, are the best qualified to make decisions about how it should be regulated. So, and we've seen this in on Wall Street with high frequency trading where, you know, there've been now regulations on on and what can be done in terms of high frequency trading. And we seem to have a lot of faith in that. We certainly don't question it um, or I don't. But, you know, and so so that's where I think, you know, these things of, that are that are applied more you know, across a society or a social, a social, a group of people are really way more complicated. You know, and, and on one hand, I, I agree with you, Mary, in that it definitely is the technologists need to understand how their technology can and might be used. Um, and, you know, one of the things I assume we'll get into a little later is Mary and I have been talking a lot about how here at Rensselaer we're going to bring this into our uh, curriculum and where right. it, and where and yeah. how we make I'd sure all our students that. know this. But, but at the same time, um, any advanced technology can be used in ways that some people would think are good and some people think are bad. And really, that's a lot of what the public um, system is about, the policymakers, things like that. So, so my worry, and I actually spent some of my time now, just last week, I was talking to members of the science committee of Congress about exactly the issue of AI and ethics, 
because this is the group that actually regulates not so much what the regulation. So this wouldn't be the group that figures out what the limitations are. This would be the group that figures out um, should NSF be required, National Science Foundation be requiring that scientists in, a, in an AI proposal explain the ethical dimensions, or should they be mm-hmm. looking at it more widely, maybe for all computer scientists, which is actually what I was advocating, um, should we be seeing it? So, so in other words, what should the policymakers know? And then the other question is, how do we get people into government? Uh, so if people are going to be making decisions about this, they need to really understand the technology, either through appropriate advising or through being able to hire people. And so one of the problems is we already have trouble finding people to come be professors. Companies, smaller companies are having trouble finding people who aren't going to bigger companies. So until we have a lot more people who understand this stuff, it gets harder. One of the things we've been talking to some of our partner schools about is uh, actually getting some of the AI into their public administration curriculums mm-hmm. so that those students come out understanding some of the issues of data analytic fairness and biasing and things like that. Well, do you, uh, speaking of curriculum, and since you want to talk about it, do you, do you want to get into, I mean, as educators here at a university, how do you incorporate these concerns into your curriculum? So that's something that um, is very near and dear to my heart. So we've been working for a number of years of how best to position the humanities, arts, and social sciences within a a world-class STEM institution. And um, in the past, it seems as if it's like the humanities, arts, and social sciences was, was described to me as a way of rounding off the corners of engineers, which to me seemed... I didn't know they had corners, um, <laughs> but now I do. And uh, the other thing is lost opportunity, right? So the thing that then we worked on with the faculty was the development of this um, revised Haas, Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences core curriculum that really puts in the first year those foundational questions of what it means to be human, what it means to be a responsible citizen. And so we ask questions of our first semester, first year students, things like, just because we can, should we? So if you go down the path of AI and you talk about generalized AI and, and you know, can we actually program a, a machine so that it has attributes of consciousness, you know, Yeah, we could probably do that. We have some very smart people. Um, But the question is, should we? And what are the ramifications if we do? I mean, do we really understand what it means to be a conscious human being? And I think, you know, there's also, uh, and obviously Mary and I agree very much on that. Yeah, we should probably fight just to make the podcast interesting. (laughs) Do you want to speak against the humans, Jim? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, I was I was rooting for Watson in the Jeopardy game, if that makes a difference. But um, the um, the thing I would say is that we really do need also to make sure that our technical courses at least touch on, if not include, significant amounts of this. And so, in fact, one of the things that's unique at Rensselaer is we're the first school that's going to require every single student, regardless of major, to take these two what we call data intensive courses, uh, what we call the data dexterity curriculum. And there's a set of objectives there. And one of those objectives is that the students will understand the these ethical issues. And just to be clear, you know, when we talk about ethics, sometimes people don't really know what we mean by that. So it's both abuses of its use, uh, you know, should we be using it appropriately or not? But there's also other things too. So for example, some algorithms do much better if you train them on Caucasian faces than non-Caucasian faces, right? Turns out it's just a subtlety of how features are detected by those things. If you're not aware of that, then and you just deploy that system, you've just done a racial biasing without even intending to. Mm-hmm. So knowing that that can happen is important. When we talk about data, right? Um, you know, we train the HR system on the people who've been hired in the past and who've been promoted. And so we say, when we bring this person in, are they like the people who get promoted most often? Well, if our previous promotion system was gender biased, Mm -hmm. then our machine will become gender biased. Not because the machine is 
capable ethically, of bias. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's that it's doing the right thing. It, it's just learning from the data, the data. So we need our students to understand that nowadays when you write a program, it's not just the program, but it's the information coming into it and how that information is used and then what's applied on the other end. And that gets into everything from self-driving cars, which are coming along, and we have students working on that, all the way up to someday these kind of general intelligences. And to be honest, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. But again, I think thinking about those issues helps us um, create the right kind of curriculum uh, I almost see that as the senior course with the freshman course being, <laughs> yeah. but what are the key issues now? And, yeah. you know, what should I make sure I do when I write my, you know, senior project and things like that? Well, that does speak to, uh, you know, the, the continued importance of the role of the human. You know, we often talk about AI in this concerned way about replacing people. I mean, what do you see as sort of the competitive edge for a human that uh, knows how these things work going forward? So, <laughs> um, so you can make robots that are way stronger than humans, um, and it is possible even with narrow AI or very domain specific to have them operate at near the same level as human intelligence. I mean, we've seen that in in medicine, and Jim can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I'm hearing 99% accuracy in like oncology diagnosis and and coming up with uh, various treatments. So the you know, so that does pose the very real question is like, what value do I have as a human to society? And there are some things that I think humans can do that it will be very, very difficult for machines to do. And, and that is that, you know, we learn over the course of our life uh, morality. We, we understand good and wrong, and we, and we understand that within a context and we can behave very rapidly um, within that context. And usually it's motivated by something else that's very human, which is compassion and empathy. So, you know, people talk also about, um, well, computers are incredibly creative. And, and even in my own research in algorithmic composition, I, I'm like, yes, I use a com an, an artificial assistant in generating music. But... I don't view that as really creative. I kind of think of that as second order creativity. It's like, it's, it, it's not genuine. So I think this is another thing that we have to come to terms with is like, how do we actually define these things? Yeah, I, um, I think Mary got the most important word and in, in when I talk about this is this word context. So, you know, I will go very firmly on the record that for the foreseeable future, humans with computers, including AI computers, will outperform either one alone. We're already seeing that, but we mm -hmm. are not seeing, except in very narrow areas. Right. So, so there's narrow areas where the computer can outperform the human. Um, in medical diagnosis, for example, when you know there's a, a tumor in the picture, find the tumor. But in fact, is there a tumor in here? We, we already know that the computers are not outperforming the expert humans. They are outperforming the novice humans. Novice humans with good computer systems are performing near the expert level. And that's been the history of many, many things in AI. Um, and the reason is, again, this, this thing we have as humans, which we call, I mean, we, call some, we, use, we use these scary terms like intuition and experience and things like that, but they're real. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a favorite example of this, which is how I ended my book on this stuff, which is a story of a, a man named Stanislav Petrov, who's also nicknamed the man who saved the world. So this was a Russian military officer who was in a nuclear bunker. And some lights went on in front that in, of him that indicated the U.S. had launched uh, nuclear arms, right, nuclear weapons, so that we were sending five missiles against Russia. And his job was to pick up the phone, call the Kremlin, and have them destroy the U.S., right? And he thought about it and said, you know, and there's long interviews with him, but he basically said, you know, in all my training and all the stuff I ever saw, I never saw an attack that looked like that. Mm -hmm. You know, why would they send a small number of missiles? It was either going to be a massive attack or a sneak attack. So the notion that there was something, just it just didn't make sense to him. And so he said, you know, I think this is our machines 
you know, we think it's a problem in the sensors. And it turned out, so it wasn't an AI system. It was his yeah. sensors were wrong. Yeah. Now imagine we replace him with, we were going to let a computer do that, you know, an AI system do that, right? That AI system currently, they're not good at knowing when is something outside what they were trained on and when isn't. And that's where humans yeah. step in. And, you know, I have a lot of other, you know, much simpler examples of these. One of the things we do a lot is something called visual question answering. We, we show a picture and we ask the computer a question about it. And the idea is to train the computer. And, these. and when you sh ask questions about what's in the picture, the computer does pretty good, right? We're not yet at human level. This is a research area, but it's growing quickly. But if you ask the computer something completely ridiculous about the picture, a human would say, what are you talking about, uh, you know? I show you a picture of an airplane landing and I say, what is the baby holding? You would say, that doesn't make any sense. The computer, the current AI system says an airplane or actually, actually it says ski poles, but we won't go into that. Right? I mean, what's clearly a crazy answer because the assumption of the people who built the system was people wouldn't ask it stupid questions. But if we don't train it on the, if we don't try those stupid questions, how will we know what happens when the computer's done. And, and that's actually part of why we don't have autonomous cars on the road yet, because we can prove that most of the time they do really well. We just know that occasionally they make crazy errors. We just don't know when, right? And until we can really answer that question, know what's causing it, know how to make them better, you're going to still need a human sitting there monitoring it the way they would in a Tesla nowadays or something like that. So we're getting more and more AI assistance in our car, but we're not ready to turn over the full autonomy to it yet. And I think we're still every everybody who said we would have it there by now has now had to back off because it just turned out to be much harder than we thought. And it's again this context issue. Yeah. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Oh no, well, I was gonna. I was just gonna ask. Uh, you know, you've both. <laughs> You've mentioned sort of post World War II and the example you just gave. I mean, are there other examples from history we can turn to? I think when we're in our current age, and this is probably always the case, you always think that you're sort of on the edge of what's ever happened. Other lessons out there that we can sort of extract to, as we go forward. Yeah, it's hard to know how sharp this edge is. <laughs> um, but I mean, you can go back uh, to 10,000 years before Christ and think about the you know, the, the development of agriculture and what that did um, to the way humans live. I mean, it literally changed us from a nomadic culture to, to being rooted in homes, and that gave rise to population explosion, which then gave rise to some socioeconomic status, right? And then, you know, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit here to like the Industrial Revolution, and, and you get things like the invention of the steam engine, and then now we have robber barons, and then we see the beginning of economic inequality. And then here we are today where, you know, after everything that happened um, in 2008 and beyond, we see even more economic disparity. So these things do have real consequences. And so for, I mean, they call this the fourth. Some industrial. people call this the fourth industrial yeah. revolution. Yeah. So, you know, what I would say is let's go back to one, two, and three and see what we got wrong. Yeah, and I think, I think that's exactly right. And the one thing that's different this time is the speed with which some of this stuff can happen now because of, not even just because of the speed of AI improvements, but simply the, um, what's powering a lot of that AI improvement is simply speed of computer, more memory, a lot of these things. So... Um, Many of the techniques that are suddenly being used today have been around. People think it was just came out overnight. I mean, we've been working on some of these things for 40, 50 years yeah. and just now really seeing the fruits of that labor. But the uh, speed with which these things could be deployed, how quickly now businesses can pick up, and again, without meaning to abuse the use of this. So, so, you know, what's happened to privacy legislation versus what's happening in privacy is something that the speed with which people were able to do the abuses was so much faster than the speed with which policy could come in. Whereas with television, television didn't come, you know, wasn't in everybody's house tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have, you, you sort of, it was a long time for the TV penetration to be sort of like the penetration of Alexa, 
right, yeah. which listens to every word you speak and is sending it to Amazon. And, you know, you know, they claim to be doing certain things with it, but where is the regulation about what they can and can't do with it? it it's pretty much self-regulation. So again, a lot of the other thing we need our students to understand is what is happening in these spaces, what happened in the past, but also how fast that may happen now, because we're talking a generation or two. I'm teaching a course this uh, summer called AI and Fiction and Fact, and it's actually looking at the science fiction visions, looking at the current technologies and saying, you know, how do we read an article and tell whether it's really fiction or really fact? Yeah. And um, one of the things I say to the students all the time is, you know, for, for me, this is an intellectual exercise. For them, this is what they're going to be living with. This is the technology that's going to be changing the world over the next 20, 30 years while they're out either creating it or living with it. They're going to be the leaders in this field, and they must understand what the parameters of what we can and can't do, and when new things come along, how do you tell how they change that? So this really is a crucial thing for the current generation. Will it be possible for them to get ahead of it, or, or will we always sort of be a step behind the abuses if they're going that fast? So I think public policy as currently performed in the U.S., very hard to stay ahead of. On the other hand, you know, again, as people understand this better, as some of our students do end up in government or law firms or wherever, those kind of things will happen. We, we will have a, um, this, this year we'll have the first AI. So there's been many conferences on AI and the law for a long time. That's mm -hmm. sort of about how you do legal reasoning with AI systems. But now uh, the Association of Computing Machinery is, is creating a... Um, a new conference, which is bringing together lawyers and computer scientists to start talking about some of these emerging issues. Where will the liabilities lie and things like that? Because those are actually, in our society, crucial aspects of, of what we've been talking about. And again, if, if um, public law can take a long time to come into being, a legal case against right. a company okay. happens yeah. very quickly. And so a lot of people are thinking about that kind of framework and us having technologists who understand that what they do is going to have impact in that space could really be a big difference. Yeah, that's a that's a really important point. And, so, and historically, you can draw from like what happened with Napster in the music industry, yeah. right? And then they wait until there's all these lawsuits happening, and then they finally say, "Oh, you know what? We need to do something about our copyright law and the way that artists are paid." And um, I mean, we'll we'll probably see. You know, I don't want to take us too far off course, but I mean, I think the same thing's going to happen in the gig economy where there's going to be lots of abuses of human labor, and it's going to end up in litigation. Right. And, you know, um, when we talk about things like future and work and things like that, yeah. you know, the other thing is there's a tendency to do these things at a very general level. So big debate going on in the AI field now is will it put more people out of work or put more people in work? What's not being discussed is they're different people. So there will be people out of work, regardless of which model you believe. And even if it creates new jobs, those jobs will be taken by our students, not by the people who have been put out of work necessarily. And so, again, how will those kind of balances work? If you look at the um, previous industrial revolutions, you see exactly that happen. Mm -hmm. But typically over courses of 40, 50, 100 years. Now we may be seeing that over courses of four, five, 10, 20 years. And that's yeah. really why we need to bring this to our students in a real way and make it very clear that the consequences, and I'll let Mary talk a little bit about unintended consequences, because oh, yeah. that's a really crucial So I, I just wanted to riff a little bit on what you just said, because we did see a glimmer of that in um, the use of robots and them being introduced into the automotive industry, where it replaced many workers. But of course, prior to that, we had huge advances in organized labor in this country, which did a lot to build the middle class. So there was a lot of, you know, more economic equality as a result of that. And then as the robots began to replace human workers in the auto industry, those positions were lost and they were, were not made up. And that is a, a group of people that, that really fell behind. So, so that is an unintended consequence. I mean, if you look at corporations and you could pick GM or pick any one of them, 
And I mean, they're going to be motivated to try to keep their production costs as low as possible so that they can bring you know, some profit to the corporation and bring a good product at a reasonable price. And some of those jobs, quite honestly, I've seen them. They're pretty horrible where you're doing the same thing over and over again for eight hours a day. And machines don't generally make the same kind of mistakes. They don't get tired and things like that. But at the same time, you know, so, so this is like what you were alluding to earlier, Jim. I mean, with any technology, there's good things and there are bad things. And what you have to do with the unintended kind of consequences is try to minimize the ill effect of any technology, you know. Absolutely. And it's at, and the other thing, you know, I think warning people at large, and again, something we're trying to at least say to our students is it can't just be all about the money. Yes, you can make a profit off of doing something, but think about the impact. Yeah. Because there's probably a way to make that same money without the negative consequences if you've thought about what they may be and how they might arise. Yeah, well said. Well, Mary Simone and Jim Hendler, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Why Not Change the World is recorded in the soloist suite at MPAC, the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thank you to the MPAC staff for their assistance, and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>